Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Carol Tomhave. I'm the part-time um, administrator for the American Discovery Trail Society and, and the only staff member. Everything else is done by volunteers. Um, we're very gratified that uh, so many of our members gave of your Saturday to come and be with us today. Um, that's wonderful. We love to see that high level of interest. And it's definitely one of the silver linings of this crazy year that we find ourselves in since we're meeting virtually. It, we are more able to include, to include you. Um, we've said this once already, but if you've just come on recently, you probably want to try to get your Zoom onto speaker view rather than gallery view. There will be PowerPoints as a part of the meeting this morning and um, at our dry run, it, we felt that that was the best view to see the slides and to see the speaker. Also, if you do not use um, full screen, full screen will cause the person to be superimposed on the slide. So you might not be able to read everything that's on the slide. So um, maybe take it off of full screen. And, um, Feel free, members, feel free if you have a question during the meeting to use the chat box and board members, I'll ask that you kind of keep an eye on the chat box and um, try to answer the question if you know it. Otherwise, if there's time at the end, we can have a little bit of a Q&A session as well. Um, finally, if you don't mind muting yourself, unless you're speaking, that will um, avoid things like telephones and dogs uh, from switching the speaker screen to, to someone that did not mean to be the speaker at that moment. And that's kind of all of the just logistical things I have. Again, welcome, thank you for being here. And at this point, I would like to turn, uh, turn it over to Eric Seaborg who is the president of the American Discovery Trail Society and also one of the three person team who originally scouted the trail. So take it away, Eric. Hey, thanks. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes giving you a little bit of background about the trail and about the, um, in the organization. And I think um, Carol will start showing some slides as I'm, as I'm talking. As I was a, just a word about myself, I'm a um, former president of the American Hiking Society. I was at in the 1980s and that led to me being on the scouting team in, the, in 1990. And um, so that I'm still here and involved is a sign of both my commitment um, to the trail, but also for my weakness for not passing the baton on to um, other people. Now the ADT was conceived because there was no coast to coast trail is to fill the need of um, having a coast to coast trail. And as we like to say, to form the backbone of the national trail system. Now, because the trail does not follow a geographic feature like the Appalachian Trail does or the Pacific, Pacific Crest Trail does, it has challenges, um, special challenges such as how do you deal with population centers? and we address this by going through cities, going, taking on cities not as a bad thing, but as something that could add cultural interest to the trail. Um, but often it turns out when you're going across the country, cities are some of the best places to go through um, because there's greenways there. There's often, you know, uh, river walks, things like that. Now the American Discovery Trail was studied by the National Park Service to be a National Scenic Trail in the 1990s. And that study found that the trail is not eligible and not appropriate to be a National Scenic Trail because of those urban aspects. But the study team conceived of a new category of National Discovery Trail and recommended that, designation is that. Um, that, however, requires another act of Congress, another um, an, an amendment to the National Trail Systems Act, and Congress has never made that designation. And we'll talk a little more about legislation later. Um, so where are we now? For many years, 
there's been a completed usable route coast to coast that people could follow. Um, we've had turn by turn directions for it for uh, at least 20 years. Um, we have it all mapped. At one time we even sold maps, but the company that did that went out of business on us. And so that's a constantly changing landscape and it's a real challenge um, as, to, as to keeping those sorts of things up to date. The route itself, and these are very rough numbers. It's about 40% off-road, um, and that means single track trails, bike trails, green walks, and sidewalks. It's about 30% gravel roads, and it's about 30% paved roads. That gravel road number, however, is a little bit misleading because it because in a lot of places, like in like in what you're seeing on your screen right there in Nevada or say in rural Kansas, being on an unpaved road is at least as good as being on a trail. Um, I can say from experience that some of those valleys in Nevada, they're so sandy that you're really glad to be on a packed um, gravel road. Doing a through hike of the American Discovery Trail has challenges that other trails, other long distance trails don't. And that's largely because of the landscape it goes through, the number one being that there's a, kind of a lack of camping infrastructure. Um, there's just not enough places to camp. And so you have to do a lot of creativity in finding places to camp. Uh, for the organization, another challenge is our small budget. Um, our, frankly, our biggest needs are money and members. We have about a thousand members, depending on how you count the members, how big a window you use. And for some perspective on that, the American Hiking Society has about 4,000 members. So the American Hiking Society has 4,000 members. The local group that I'm a member of, the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, has more like 6,000 members. So you can see it's just much harder to attract members to national groups than it is to local groups. Um, the, our local group you know, has, has trail building, things like that. Um, so it's a small budget at this point, uh, about $70,000, $80,000 a year. And at this point, it's almost all um, individual donations. And that's kind of an admitted weak spot of the organization is, is a failure to go for grants and business do donations. And that I think is just because we haven't had someone step up to uh, take that on. Um, the business, business, excuse me, biggest expenses are printing and administration is what we spend most of our money on. We get an amazing amount done by volunteers. As I said, we have a trail, we have a way that you can do it. We have kind of an infrastructure where people um, often help travelers. Um, we have one person staff part-time, but we have the structure of volunteer state coordinators and um, board members who do so much of the work. Uh, we're also, we're a collection of independent trails that are managed by local jurisdictions. And so that's sort of a conceptual challenge for many people uh, because people say, well, what is it that the organization does? Well, we try to put, we try to put the route together, but local people manage all of the trails along the way. And we don't actually build trails ourselves, although I should say we haven't so far. I would say the long-term goal, I think we'd love to do that in the future. Um, but aside from identifying the ADT route itself, the existence of the project has had a big impact on the development of local trails who say they can tie into a national trail. For instance, in Iowa, being part of the, if you have a trail that you want to do a proposal for, if you can say that you're a part of the ADT or, or connect to the ADT, um, it helps in your, in your scoring for grant requests. In, in Des Moines, for instance, every grant request that led to the creation of those trails mentioned that they're a part of the ADT. Um, one of the major focuses right now of the organization is improving signage on the trail. And that's much more complex than you would ever guess because 
of since we are a collection of different trails, we have to go to every single different place um, and get permission to put up signs. Um, and, and I think I think we flashed through some examples. Um, we recently had, as a, as a slide sh shows, we recently had um, a very encouraging development in that Congress passed um, an act that told federal, man federal land managers that they needed to, to allow signs on the trail. And this was important because <laughs> for a long time, we couldn't get the federal land managers to allow the trail to be signed because they said, well, you've been proposed as a national discovery trail, but it hasn't happened. So you, you, so we were just in sort of a limbo. Um, another, another, another way that we're always, um, another aspect of the trail, excuse me, is that we're always working to improve the route. For example, last year in Missouri, uh, the Rock Island Spur came online that extended the Katy Trail and greatly improved our off-road mileage across the state. Um, in, in Delaware, there's a new rail trail that is being created uh, near the Eastern Terminus that'll get us about eight miles of trail instead of, instead of road walk. So that goes on, you know, on step-by-step, case-by-case basis. And I guess I'm going to now turn it over to tell you about a reroute, one of the, probably the biggest reroute that we have ever had, and that's in Nevada. And Samantha, who's the state coordinator, state coordinator for Nevada, is going to talk a little about why that was and um, what it's like. So, Samantha. Hi, everyone. I'm Samantha Sorka. I'm the state coordinator for Nevada. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And can you guys all see that? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to update you on the Nevada reroute project quickly. Um, this is a project that was many years in the making, um, but this year we made tremendous progress on, on it. To remind you why we were working on a reroute in Nevada, um, such a major reroute, um, there were a number of places in Nevada where unfortunately the original ADT route was no longer feasible. Uh, either the trails were gone or, or hadn't been maintained in years. Uh, and so in some places the trail was impassable or or, or dangerous, quite frankly. And so a lot of times our through travelers, especially those going cross country doing a, the whole trail, uh, were opting to cross Nevada on Highway 50 instead of the actual trail. Uh, and so that's not ideal. Um, so our goal was to create a, a, a reroute that was, uh, would keep people in the back country, um, still be challenging, but safe uh, and accessible for hikers cyclists and, and equestrians. So here's what we did. Uh, to orient you, Reno in California uh, on the left side of your screen, Utah on the right, Vegas at the bottom. Uh, the trail, uh, the, the new route is the shades of blue and the original uh, route is the red line. So you can see that the new route is, is the same let me see if I can explain this right. The new route is the same as the original route, except in the places where the red line is visible. So for example, at the beginning, we didn't change anything. Uh, as you travel west, we changed a little bit here. Where the red lines pop out or where we have deviated. So uh, this is the Egan Range here in eastern Nevada. The original route went over this pass uh, here on the red line, but we have diverted it to the south over a better pass. Uh, really the two biggest um, changes are where are in the central part of the state. So the original route veered to the south, we've, we've gone to the north, uh, and then the opposite here, the original route went up north and we veered to the south. 
Um, the green lines in here are alternate routes that we've created for bikes to avoid the wilderness section or for any user in um, case of a heavy snowpack year because those wilderness sections can be pretty difficult. Uh, and then when you get closer to California, the original route, uh, we didn't change much. Um, so, but these are big, big changes and it required a lot of uh, several years of ground proofing and, and uh, work. Uh, and all the trail in Nevada is on public land, all of it. So it was really critical that we were able to get buy-in and support from all the land managers, especially the federal land managers. Uh, and I've been able to form some really great relationships here with the Nevada uh, Depart uh, Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service, and then also Nevada State Parks because our trail goes through uh, six state parks. All the agencies that I've met with and formed relationships with here have gone over the new route. They've all approved it. Uh, most of the trails on BLM land, so they did require a little bit of paperwork to approve uh, the signage. And that was just an environmental impact uh, kind of sign off, uh, but that was all filed and signed with no issues. So everything's uh, been approved and is, is good in Nevada. Everyone's happy with it. Uh, and so now we've begun to get signage up on the trail. There was no signage on the original route. So that actually made it, uh, is making this a little bit easier. I actually just finished marking the first 150 miles starting at the Utah border. Uh, there's me. Um, so in addition to putting up signs and installing new carcinite markers where they're needed, uh, I'm also building the new turn by turn directions as I go and, and doing uh, the final ground proofings. And I should be heading back out soon, hoping next week actually to do the next section of, of marking. And so that's where the project stands right now. I wanna thank everybody in the ADT uh, on the board for supporting it and all the volunteers on the ground who helped us get here. Uh, so far the trail has been ridden on horseback uh, by me uh, in its entirety. And it's been mountain biked several times. And um, that was all kind of done when we were working on putting the new route together. And now there's a proposal for a, to, to through hike the new route sometime next year. And so we'll see, and we're excited about that. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting trail users across Nevada on this new route moving forward. So uh, thank you so much. I, I would make, one comment on there's uh, Samantha obviously has done a lot of work on this, but one thing that to me is almost a miracle is that for years and years we have been trying to get the Bureau of Land Management to let us mark the route and we thought well that was not very controversial because it's on a lot of um, roads and it seemed like that wouldn't be such a big environmental impact and yet they were always telling us, oh, no, we got to study it to death before we could ever do that. And so how Samantha I got the buy-in from all those people is just just an achievement in itself. So, and I should point out that we just, we just changed the agenda a little on what we sent out to you because we had the legislative efforts coming before the Nevada reroute, but then I looked at what I was talking about and it, and it um, segued straight into what we were gonna have Samantha talk about. So that's why we did that. But now we wanna find, um, talk a little about the legislative efforts that we've had or have going on. Okay, I can start explaining that. My name is Peter Shotley and I am the Maryland State Coordinator as well as the uh, congressional liaison. And I think we, the American Discovery Trail Society has really achieved a lot so that I'll cover a little bit of the legislative history and then explain what our goals are down the road. First, our major goal, this is a long standing goal, is to make the American Discovery Trail part of the US national trail system. And we're sort of halfway there. And let me explain this. Uh, way back in the 90s, the leaders of your society took a big step forward and got Congress to pass a law mandating the National Park Service to do a study. What should be done with this gigantic trail from coast to coast? Should it be a trail? Would it work? 
Does it make sense? The National Park Service looked at this for two years and they came back and said, yes, this is a great trail. This absolutely makes sense, but there's a problem. And the problem is that the national trail system calls for two kinds of trails, a scenic trail, a wilderness trail, like Pacific Crest or Appalachian Trail, or a historic trail like Santa Fe Trail or Oregon Trail. And the problem was that this American Discovery Trail was neither. It's not wilderness. It goes through all kinds of cities, San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, Cincinnati, Washington, DC. So it's not wilderness. And it's not historic because it was just strung together from lots of existing routes back in the 1980s and 90s. So it's neither historic nor scenic. So the National Park Service recommended that a third, a new category of trail be accepted in this legislation, namely a discovery trail. The idea is that you discover the US cultural, natural history, scenery, people as you transit the US. So the goal has been to implement that and several different sessions of Congress have moved forward on that, but we've never quite reached the finished line. Two years ago, because we were just stuck in the House Natural Resources Committee, we did a slight detour. We asked for half a loaf. And that was the problem was the National Park Service internal rules gave each park superintendent authority on allowing signage or not. Some people allowed it, some superintendents did it. We had an awful situation here in the Chesapeake uh, CNO Canal in Maryland where an earlier superintendent allowed it, signs were installed. A later superintendent came in and said, I don't like signs and ripped them all out. And so whenever we wanted to install signage, the Park Service said, no, that's not a national decision, that's a local decision. So we went to the Senate and said, why can't you introduce a law, a bill that requires the two relevant secretaries, Secretary of Interior managing the Park Service and BLM, and the Secretary of Agriculture managing forests, national forests, require them to just help us put up signs. We're gonna provide the signs, no expense for the taxpayer, no money from the treasury, just let us help up put up signs. The Senate liked our idea and put that into their mega bill. And this became law last year in 1919. So now there is a legal requirement that park superintendents and the National Park Service and the forests, National Forests, have to work with us to install signs. That's a huge step forward. And we're in the process of doing that as Eric has already mentioned. We've made some progress, but still have a ways to go. So our current effort now is to pass a bill called HR that stands for House of Representatives 726. And this would make the American Discovery Trail part of the US national trail system. It's stuck in Congress and we haven't gotten anywhere yet on that. Uh, and I think we will easily get a majority in both the House and the Senate after this election. The obstacles have largely been the very conservative uh, members of Congress from Western states who just don't like trails and who uh, say, why should there be more trails? Let me explain to you two of the arguments against it so that you can judge by yourself why those are invalid. The one argument against it is, oh, this is gonna cost the National Park Service a lot of extra money, maintenance fees. They will now suddenly have the job of maintaining hundreds, thousands of miles of trail. And the answer to that is no, that's a total misunderstanding. The trail presently is being maintained by all the jurisdictions where the trail transits. For example, in Washington, DC, the trail comes into DC in Rock Creek Park. That's a national park the National Park Service presently maintains that. Then it enters DC streets. Well, the city of 
Washington, D.C. maintains those sidewalks and streets. Then it leaves D.C. and enters the CNO Canal, where it's presently maintained by the National Park Service. So there's no additional maintenance task required for any of this, because presently it's being maintained by all the jurisdictions that currently control their section of the trail. So this idea or this fear that it would overwhelm the Park Service with additional uh, challenges, additional costs is, is not really valid. A second key point is our approach is quite different from, for example, trails to trails or uh, the East Coast Greenway or some other trails. We, we are not asking for any money. We are not asking any federal appropriations or state appropriations or city appropriations to buy land. The trail already exists. All we wanna do is make it an official part of the US national trail system. We're not out to do what the Trails for Trails does, which is buy up railway, old railway rights of way and convert those into trails. So we're not asking for any money. There's no challenge to the federal treasury or, or budgets, that's not an issue. Um, so that's the two main points about it. And all the bills die at the end of the Congress. So starting in January, we're gonna go back to the Congress and ask our sponsors to reintroduce that bill, HR 726. Now it'll get a new number depending on what date it's introduced, but it's gonna be basically try to do the same thing. It's a very simple bill that costs no money. Another thing to stress is it's bipartisan. This is not a partisan political issue. It's introduced by Congressman uh, Fortenberry who is a Republican from Lincoln, Nebraska. It has another Nebraska Republican Congressman co-sponsor and lots and lots of Democratic co-sponsors. So it was introduced by a Republican. The two initial co-sponsors when it was introduced are two Democrats at each end of the trail. On the West End Pacific coasts, it's Jared Huffman, a Democrat. And on the Atlantic end of the trail, it's uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester, the Congresswoman from Delaware. So it's clearly bipartisan. And we hope that next year, uh, we've got 21 co-sponsors this year and usually about that number. That'll be enough to persuade the National Natural uh, Lands Committee in the House to hold hearings, which we expect to have no real problem. And then it would go to both chambers and hopefully they'll achieve our goal of making the American Discovery Trail a part of the national trail system. Now, one last point is I, I talked to lots of folks on the Hill, but you all are key players. In other words, words from you, con contacting your member of Congress is what's critical. They wanna hear from their constituents, that's you out in the country, you to tell them that yes, you support this trail, making the Discovery Trail part of the national trail system. And that's word from you, the local voters, the local citizens, uh, really is all the difference. You can do what one of our folks in Maryland has done, which has got a local town, the city of Denton in uh, Eastern Maryland, to pass a town council resolution sponsoring and, and supporting the trail. So that's evidence of local support. And that's what members of Congress and senators wanna see. So that's the end of my session. I'm optimistic about next year. I'm hoping that you will feel energized and let your members of Congress and senators know that uh, it has local support. And I encourage you to keep at it because I think uh, I'm optimistic and we'll get there. Thanks very much. I think now it's uh, Bob Palin comes next. That's right. So why don't you go ahead, Bob? Okay. Hey. We'll do. Let me find my screen. <laughs> so I am Bob Palin. Um, I didn't show my face for long, which is good. Uh, I'm the webmaster for <laughs> the American Discovery Trail. And let's see if I can go through this forward. Yes. So I thought I'd just share some of the statistics from the uh, website. 
We're getting quite a few views. We, we roll along 500 a day. We had one tremendous day which blew our server apart where we had 6,400 visits. And it turned out that um, Microsoft had used us as the answer of a quiz question. It took quite a while to figure that out, why we'd suddenly had one good day. It was a good thing. Um, the biggest uh, source is, of course, Google, like everybody else. Interestingly, and thanks to Sam, the uh, Nevada State Parks is, is our biggest individual non-search engine that uh, sends people to us after that Wikipedia. Um, you can read them. The rest is just obvious things. I also run the Facebook group. Uh, Sharon Weekly runs the page. As you can see, we have a lot of people have liked the page and we have quite a good bit of interaction. We answer questions there um, all the time by private message. So you're welcome to send private messages there. The group has some, uh, some lively discussion. Yes, that's what we'll call it uh, about uh, COVID. Um, with no through hikers, as I say, Keith has been providing a tremendous amount of beautiful pictures for us and they've gone on the page and the group. Uh, he's been doing day hikes. His wife takes him out. Keith, are you? Uh, I don't know if he's here, but uh, his wife takes him out to the beginning of a, a section and then he hikes for the day and she comes and picks him up and, and somebody else too, not just his wife. So uh, he's done the entire, he's done all of uh, Indiana, Southern Indiana and most, I think almost all of Illinois this spring. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the um, website. You can, you're welcome to send me questions by email. Uh, which will be presented in a moment or on private message. Um, I plan on redoing the website at some point if I ever finish with my next presentation. Um, we need more, probably the, the big picture on the front page is really nice, but um, whether we need to keep doing that, I don't know. But we might want to put more menu items. We're showing Eric instead of me, why is that? Oh, oh I'm talking, so I don't see myself. My next uh, presentation, I, Caroline, stop me if I'm not supposed to go to this one straight away. You are, you're I, good. Okay. Keep I've kind of lost where I am. There we go. Present. Okay. It, and you did change your background, so you got books back there. So yes, that's, 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 <laughs> books very, and very cameras. And I, I, for those that don't know, I've, I've I'm shy about showing my house. Uh, I live by myself and I'm a 64 year old uh, teenager. So it's a mess. <laughs> um, I'm also in charge of most of the information technology for the American Discovery Trail. And we've been creating a new database over the last six months or so. We had a, a bug in the software and when we tried to fix it, we discovered we couldn't. And the host said, well, we're amazed it works at all. So it was time to do something about that. We've moved the database to the same host that does our website, which saved us money and, and gave us a lot more power. So the, the new database will be able to have many more features. Um, obviously the contents of the database are the trail. Uh, as you can see, it's split into sections, segments, waypoints, and track points. Yeah, you do not, you're not screen sharing, Bob. I'm not? At least not on my screen. Your oh. second presentation is not up. Hold on. I thought I was. I will go back to. So you haven't seen anything I'm talking about? No, I see you. Okay, share screen. Uh, this one. We saw the first one, the website one. There we go. Yeah, are you seeing? Do you see this one? Yes. yes. All right. Let me just. The slides you missed are not really that important. Basically, I I like the picture of the computer, so you get to see that one again. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, the trail is in there. There are 20 sections, 154 segments, 4,000 waypoints, and 133,000 track points, except that Samantha has provided me with many thousands more. So that number will increase quite a lot. Uh, the new Nevada has a lot more track points than the old Nevada did which is great. Um, this is not a big database. Millions of records are normal in a database, so we're not straining anything here. 
Um, I'll move right on since then. So I, I thought I'd explain what the track points are, what, what, I'm, what the points are. I started by saying segments are stretches of trail. So um, well, I'll make that more clear in a bit. Waypoints are the important things. That's what tells us where to go, where to turn, and what's at individual locations. Track points are in, invisible points uh, that make the actual track between the waypoints. And here's the example of me being victimized at a waypoint in Utah. That's Brad Marrow and he bombarded with a snow point, snowballs. We, we had to take the snow alternative um, because the, the top of the mountain up here was completely covered in snow. He had a lot of fun doing that. So the product of the database uh, is mainly these two documents, the turn by turn guide, which is a textual guide has each waypoint in it and written directions between them. And then GPX files. Um, they're used with GPS units and mapping programs. You can use them with Google Earth, with Basecamp, and numerous G um, Gaia GPS is my favorite. Uh, you can use those to map out the points. So here's an example of a turn by turn. You can see that it has the distance between each waypoint. And then at the waypoint, some instructions this is the waypoint name over here and it's latitude and longitude. Uh, this, this column I can't see is the altitude. And here, here's an example of part of a GPX file mapped out. The purple numbers are the waypoints and the green numbers are the track points. Normally you would not see the track point names. It's just a line that's drawn between. You can see that they, they follow the actual exact path. So if you were to try to walk from 203.10 to 203.20, you'd probably run into some difficulties across that stretch. You really do need the actual track. There's a section here where you can see the track. You can see how many there are, uh, 133,000 across 6,000 miles. <laughs> so the, the new data, the old database didn't contain these track points, which made it hard to relate them to the waypoints. Once I had the database in place, I went through most of the uh, track points so far and lined them up with individual waypoints so that we have a real track that joins the, joins the waypoint dots. Uh, when I said all waypoints are on the track, that's not quite true. <laughs> I still have about a thousand to do. <laughs> but uh, many of them are done automatically. I wrote a program that said, if the track point is within 20 feet of the waypoint, automatically hook them up. So that covers about 80%. The rest I have to look into individually, which has provided lots of entertainment. Um, the waypoints themselves just used to be in order. Uh, now they're between segments. There was no connection between the end of one segment and the start of a new one. They would just change name. Uh, now I've been hooking up the ends of segments. That will allow us to write programs that, that can actually traverse the trail. And you could build a route saying, go to the next bicycle alternate, take the next bicycle alternate, don't take it, take the snow alternate, and build an individual customized trail for yourself. Um, then the, the services, we've always had services available. Um, but they were built into the waypoints themselves. And I've separated those out, which will give us the ability to search the database for particular waypoints with services. An example might be um, camping, campgrounds. You could, uh, you could say, where is the next campground along the trail on my given route? Um, you could say, find me a campground every 20 miles. It won't work, but you could ask it. <laughs> we don't have that much detail just yet. And then other things like post offices, because people send packages by general delivery. So you can, uh, you can find post offices at suitable points, the indoor lodging, and of course, the nearest dentist. Uh, that's been important to me on some of my hikes. <laughs> um, big disclaimer, uh, this, the data in the database is old and incomplete, and COVID will change some of it, no doubt, for restaurants and things like that. Um, so along the way, we're going to have to update this data and we really need all of 
people out there on the trail and just where you live, if you live along the trail, to, to update our information. And uh, as I say, the lawyers will have something to say, I'm sure. We, we don't really have lawyers, but if we did, they'd have something to say about it. Um, so it's important that, that we get some crowdsourcing and we will be providing a way to do that. Other features we've added are points of interest. Um, things near the trail that you might, wait, might want to go look at. Near being a relative term, we, we haven't really decided what that means. It might be half a mile for a ball of uh, twine. It might be six miles for a great view from a um, mountaintop somewhere, who knows. And then, then of course, all those statues of Eric along the trail. Uh, it's not really Eric, but... <laughs> Uh, as well as the alternate types we have now, we'll be adding new ones, like perhaps a scenic alternate. And we may have, um, may allow users to create their own alternates. So somebody has an idea for a really nice day hike off the ADT, we may allow people to uh, build that and add it themselves. We'll see how that goes. So that's what we'll be allowing with the users to do. Um, We'll keep direct editing to ourselves because it's just too, it's too much to, to monitor other people editing the database. But we will allow submissions of um, corrections, corrections, suggestions, new things by a, a set of online forms, which are, are coming ready right now. Won't be releasing those for a little while, but we'll be doing it amongst ourselves for a little while before we release them to the public. And when we do photo uploads and stories, it's another idea along the trail so that people can click on a part of the trail and see who's been there before, what they saw, what their experience was, that kind of thing. It's not our goal to replace all trails or Gaia GPS or anything like that. Uh, so we won't be doing general purpose trails. Everything will be strictly ADT related. Um, I think that makes sense. Users will need to have an account to, to be able to uh, upload things to our system. Um, everybody that's ever used the store, we can automatically create an account for. And if we have an email address, we will create an account for you. If we don't have your email address, please send it to carol at info at discoverytrail.org. We're trying to collect email addresses. Uh, we are not going to spam you. You'll, you'll receive no unsolicited, unsolicited mail by doing this um, by, by using this system. Carol may send you reminders and things. You won't receive any database email uh, unsolicited. Um, the reason we have to use the account is that, that if you ever used a forum or a, a bulletin board, they get tremendous amount of junk mail and we really need to stop that. I had to turn off comments on the um, website because we were getting flooded with people. It was crazy. It was almost all the comments were spam. And every morning I'd wake up and there were 10 that I had to moderate. And it's just not worth it. Um, I had better things to do like this. Um, the uh, database will know which items you own. So if you've bought the California GPX file, it will allow you access to that. But if you haven't bought the Nevada one, you won't have access to that. Um, it will remind you when there are updates to you, the items that you currently own. Um, you will be able to suggest things outside the things you own, assuming you have a way of knowing where they are. Um, that's not a problem. Right, and, and because we're, we're getting information from the store, I just wanted to make sure you knew that um, we don't have access to any financial information that you've entered in the store. We use a system called Shopify, and they keep all of that carefully hidden behind their certified firewalls and database walls and so all of that sort of stuff. We, don't, we have no access to that. Carol, of course, has access if you send her you know, renewal. Um, we do know that information. The database is up and running. Um, 5,000 edits, uh, made by hand. It's a bit misleading because sometimes one edit adds up to two. Uh, and a lot of programmatic edits, probably twice as many. I haven't actually counted those. We're aiming at getting, we've been aiming at Thanksgiving for a new release of all 
except Nevada. Um, but we are, we're held up just at the moment on getting permission to change the trail in one state. And uh, we, may, we may just release everything else. Um, we may wait. It's undecided at this point whether, what we'll do. We want to get the new version out so that people, hopefully people who can hike next year can plan their trails and their routes across it. User functionality will come later. I, I imagine we'll have the first forms where you could submit updates by, uh, by the beginning of December, but probably the more complicated, you know, form your own route stuff won't be uh, out until January or February of next year. Like all software projects, it's taking longer than I imagined. <laughs> After this, um, the obvious next step is to go to a GIS format. Um, a GPX format is fine, but it's sort of two-dimensional, where a GIS you could think of as being three-dimensional. GIS uses layers, so our, our GPX would be one layer, and then you could map layers from different sites like the USGS has a tremendous number of layers. You can look at the water content of the soil around the trail if you want to. You can look at the, the um, borders of public land next to the trail. And so you know exactly when you're in public and private land, all sorts of, there are hundreds of layers um, available publicly and that continues to expand. The USGS, the BLM, all of those organizations are expanding the number of public layers that you can overlay onto a trail. However, GIS data is more complicated, um, being a picture rather than a line. And we don't have expertise. I don't have the expertise to do that on my own right now. And we don't, and the current database doesn't store um, GIS data nicely. So we would need to upgrade. And, I, and our host tells us that they're going to upgrade the um, version of the database, but not really sure I believe them. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to answer lots of questions about this, but we, we can't really do that now. So if you have questions or suggestions, please send them to that address there. I'll be at discoverytrail.org and you can find that on the uh, website. As I develop the user um, features more, I'll be putting up pages on the website and probably some demo videos of how to use the system. And I'd like to just, if I can, just quickly show you very briefly what the editor looks like. So are you seeing the editor on the screen now, Carol? Mm -hmm. You see ADTS, TBT, GBX yes. at the top? Yes. Okay, so this is, the, this is the page that I see when I log in. You won't see this, all this detail because you won't be an editor. And you can see how many there are still to do. We're working on the eastbound directions. There are 1,600 to do. 2,000 of the waypoints need services. They're mostly in the west, so they won't have any, and that will be very quick. And 1,800 of the waypoints are still not attached to the track. But as I say, 80% of those will be done automatically. This is what the editor itself looks like. These are the things called sections. They're mostly states. But where the trail splits in Ohio, they have three. And where it comes together, or the other way around, there are three. So we can go into a, oops, I didn't mean to do that. We can look at the segments within the trail. West Virginia has four regular segments and one alternate, which is taking you around the Dolly Sods wilderness area. And then within the segments, we have all of the waypoints. So this is how the editing gets done. I can edit a, I can't actually see the edit button because, of, oh, there we go. There. So this is what a waypoint looks like in the editor. Latitude and longitude, um, the instructions, westbound and eastbound, the services that are available at this particular waypoint, various notes, Th these would be notes about the waypoint, if there's something, these will be visible to the users in the turn by turn, then we keep our own, this is input from users and our own notes here. And it's attached to the, attached to another waypoint. It's also attached to a, uh, a track point. Um, 
one cool little thing is if I click on Google Maps, it will bring up the waypoint on Google Maps, which I think is kind of nice. I'd like to have each next one as well, so you could follow the track between them, but we haven't got that far yet. Anyway, very briefly, that's what the editor looks like. Um, somewhere I have, ah, there. So now you should see a picture of a forest with points on it. Is that right, Carol? You're seeing forest? Forest. Well, the little trees and, and a trail with the SIN. No. And... no, I'm back to the tickets page. Okay. Oh, really? Oh, okay. All right. Well, I probably can't show you that to you. That's a shame. Uh -huh. you, you can only share things in the browser, apparently, not individual applicants applications. Okay. Well, the tickets page, which I can't see right now, but this shows the, these are what you will submit. Um, I submitted all of these. They're basically reminders to me to do things. Uh, and, uh, a ticket sort of looks like this. It's another form. Um, hey, Bob. Yes. We need to move on to the next subject. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Right. I'm done. I've, I have just shown you briefly what I've been doing and I don't, I'll stop sharing now. Okay. I stole as many minutes as I could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks. And, and, when, and when Bob said that we've been working on this, he meant he's been doing and he's, he's, you know, literally redone the database and donated something that's worth uh, literally thousands of dollars. Um, and I, I guess I will say that, you know, we've already talked about that you could, um, um, that, that we're based on volunteers and there's a lot of ways that people can get involved. And obviously if you're listening in on this, you, you're interested in the trail, but if you live along the trail, you could, if there's a park nearby, you could contact the park managers and help with the signage. You can get your city to endorse ADT. You can get businesses to become members. You can get your tourist bureau to become a member. You can hold, you can create an event along the trail. You could get, if you're in the same state as the ADT, you could work on getting your state DOT to print the ADT route on the map, like uh, most states have the Appalachian Trail. Or you can get groups worked on affiliated, um, on get group, work on getting groups affiliated with the trail. Um, if you're not in the AD state, ADT state, if you have computer scale, skills, you could work with Bob on turn by turns and mapping. You could take on a project like getting the AAA to put the trail on their maps. Um, you can help with the fundraising by contacting corporations or um, if you think you could uh, join the board of directors and help us there, let us know. Um, and speaking of volunteers, now we're gonna have an award our annual award, I'm going to, well, I'll just let Laurel Foote take it over from here. Okay. Well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm really excited to see all the progress that we've made on the American Discovery Trail so, uh, so far this year. And, um, and so it's a delight for me to be able to um, each year be the one who gets to present the Happy Feet Award. And it's especially nice this year because it's the 20th anniversary of the award. So um, just to let you know, I know it's been drilled into you by a lot of people so far, but again, you know, we as, a, as an American Discovery Trail Society rely on volunteers. Carol is our part-time paid employee. She's our only employee. And that's really um, pretty much unheard of for a national trail. So, um, Carol is amazing, but she can't do it all by herself. And the state coordinators and the board members and the um, and other people have stepped up, but we can always use more volunteers because there's a lot to be done because it's a really big, big trail. So anyway, um, I am proud to say that the first Happy Feet Award was awarded 20 years ago to my husband, Bill Foote and I. And um, it came after we had completed the first hike and bike of the American Discovery Trail back in 1997. We did from um, Delaware using the Southern route and over to California. 
And then in 1998, we completed the northern portion of the trail in the midsection between Denver and, California, or, and Cincinnati. So um, after we came back from that trip, we felt it was so amazing that we wanted to immediately get involved with the American Discovery Trail Society. And we wanted other people to be able to experience some of the things that we had seen and appreciate what a wonderful and unique trail that it is. So um, over the years, the Happy Feet Award has been given to a lot of different people. Um, they've all been exceptional volunteers and they've ranged from board members and state coordinators to even a congressional legislative aid and there have been others too. Um, but they've all been able to fulfill the mission of the Happy Feet Award, which is written as recognizing, quote, the volunteer whose actions, enthusiasm, and commitment to the American Discovery Trail serve as an inspiration to others. Um, well, this year, the American Discovery Trail Society is happy to, uh, to award this year's award to one of our founding members, and that is Mike Rausch. Um, you know, people who experience, oh, and here's a picture of what the award looks like with Mike's name on it and the date that it's being awarded. And people who experience the American Discovery Trail in person often don't get to see all the behind the scenes things that happen um, and what goes into making a cross country trail into a reality. And Mike is very much a behind the scenes kind of a person because he does not even live in a state that the ADT traverses. Um, but he has found a way to support a cause that he really believes in. And um, so he can even do it as Eric was mentioning, you can even do it if you don't live in an American Discovery Trail state. Um, Mike is an engineer who works for a wireless technology company. And he volunteered his technical skills to help us convert our um, turn by turn directions, which Bob was talking about, they have historically only gone from east to west, and sometimes people want to go in the other direction. So Mike has been working to convert them from um, east to west orientation to a west to east orientation format. Um, and I'm not sure, is, is Mike on? Because if Mike is on, maybe he could say just a, say a word or two so that we can see him a little picture of him in the screen. Mike, um, so if you if you are there, you would have to unmute your screen and then say just a word or two, and then I think you're gonna appear right in the little portion of the screen. He did log in earlier, I know that. Okay, but, um, I don't see him right now, but maybe he's like un unmuting and whenever he gets that together, we'll hopefully have him say a word or two and then we'll be able to see Mike. But at any rate, um, I'm not sure when Mike first got involved with the um, American Discovery Trail project. Well, I know when he did it, but I don't know if he realized what he was really getting involved with because it's a lot more complicated to do this east to west, from west, east to west, to west to east. It's more than just making a few switches on a computer. It's more than just changing left to right and north to south and east to west. It really has to be carefully checked on the ground to make sure it makes sense when it's on the ground. And so this has all taken a lot of time. <coughs> As a result, Mike has been working on this um, for about um, 400 hours over the course of about three years. And um, he's, oh, and there he is. There's Mike down there. Great, thank you for being here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I hope everybody realizes that you know, this huge amount of effort we've been working on, we're trying to get it to you. And it's not only going to help the through travelers on the American Discovery Trail, but it's also going to help people who just want to do a smaller section in their area or maybe go to a specific location they really want to see and be able to hike in either direction. So first of all, I want to give everybody, uh, everyone, everybody give a big round of applause to Mike and thank him for all of his work. Ha, 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 ha. You know, there's a little button. You can do a little applause thing on your on your Zoom. If you're familiar with Zoom, you go to that and add applause. <laughs> the dog applaud. 
<laughs> Great. And um, while I can only um, award this award to uh, Mike virtually today, here I have it in person in my house. And um, luckily, Mike lives in the same city that I do. And so I will be able to hand it to him personally at some later date. And thank you again for all the wonderful work he has done. So let me just ask Mike if you want to say a couple of words about how you've, um, you know, how you've been helping and how you feel about it and that kind of stuff. So take it away, Mike. Well, uh, I guess I wasn't exactly prepared for this, but uh, whatever. Um, kind of humbled. There's a lot of people who have done a lot more, I think, to, uh, to move the uh, ADT forward. And well, I don't have a whole lot more to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're just really, really happy for all that you've done. And I know you are um, modest about your efforts, but it's huge what this project is doing and, you know, doubly huge because you don't even live in an American Discovery Trail state, but um, it, it is well earned. We all believe that it really is well earned. Okay. So well, thanks. Uh, Thank you. And, and I'll get together with you later personally to hand over the award to you. Okay. Okay. And now I'm going to turn the Zoom meeting over to another member of our awards committee, and that is John Faisal. So John, if you want to take it over at this point. Thank you, Lori. Uh, it's a pleasure. And Mike, again, congratulations for the honor. Uh, we, we survive on, on volunteers, as you might imagine. And along those same lines, um, first of all, I should introduce myself. I'm John Faisal, and I'm the former state coordinator for the American Discovery Trail in California, and one of the original state coordinators and uh, one of the four founding members of the American Discovery Trail Society. Anyway, several years ago, uh, we created a, a different award and this is a Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, people who have gone above and beyond uh, over a career in, in helping the American Disco Discovery Trail achieve what we've we achieved so far. And uh, it's named in honor of the father and the mother of the American Discovery Trail. And that's uh, Reese Lukai. And Reese was our very first recipient a couple of years ago. And uh, as you might guess, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Reese. He received, uh, he recruited trail experts from each of the states where the trail crossed. And these are the people who helped identify the original route uh, for the American Discovery Trail. And Reese was a voice, um, before uh, the Park Service and Congress, but he was the voice of the American Discovery Trail for many, many years and he continues to support it. And for that reason, uh, Reese uh, was obviously our first recipient uh, and it's called the Reese Lukai Jr. Lifetime Achievement Award. And it's my honor to introduce Reese to make this presentation. So Reese, would you uh, pick it up from here? Thank you, John. Uh, I'm gonna start and uh, I know Eric gave you a little bit of overview of how the American Discovery Trail got started, but I'm gonna give you a little closer view. Going back to 1977, when the American Hiking Society was first formed by a group in Washington, DC. Uh, at that time, one of the uh, people uh, involved across the uh, coast in the Bay Area was Hewlett Hornbeck. He was the director of the East Bay Regional Parks. And one of the people that was very much involved with him was uh, a Nobel Prize chemist by the name of Dr. Glenn Seaborg. And they together explored and developed what today is a fantastic uh, trail system within the uh, Bay region and a major part of the American Discovery Trail. 
1978, uh, one of his family members gave him a charter membership to the American Hiking Society. And by coincidence, he just happened to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, during one of the uh, AHS uh, board meetings and decided to attend. At that meeting, they were discussing a trail that would extend from Los Angeles to the East Coast. And Dr. Seaborg volunteered that if you will start the trail in San Francisco, I will lay out the entire route across California. They accepted his offer. And that became the beginning of what today uh, and then was known as Hike Nation. If you go up to the Hike Nation Facebook page, you will see uh, one of the photos, Dr. Uh, Seaborg leading 7,000 people across the Bay Bridge at the beginning of Hike Nation. In that group was a lady by the name of Susan Butch Henley. She later became the executive director of the American Hiking Society and also the American Discovery Trail. So if we skip forward uh, about 10 years to 1989, uh, 31 years ago this month at the October 1989 board meeting of uh, the American Hiking Society, they were proposing a uh, had uh, representatives from Backpacker Magazine, Peter Spires, who was the publisher, John Veeman, who was the editor, and a uh, gentleman, Bruce Franks, who was an employee. They were presenting uh, a proposal that they joined partnership with the American Hiking Society to create the American Discovery Trail that would go from coast to coast. Butch Henley, who was at that meeting, she was the executive director. She looked across the room and said, Eric, Eric Seaborg, why don't you take on this project? He eventually agreed. He called a good friend of his by the name of Ellen and said, Ellen, wouldn't you like to take a year off and hike across the country and establish a new trail? Ellen agreed, even though she had to give up, take a paid drop of about 80%. And that led to what today is known as the American Discovery Trail. If we move forward uh, to today, we'll find that Eric Seaborg, the son of Dr. Glenn Seaborg, uh, is our current president, has been for about 15 years. Prior to that, he was uh, president of the American Hiking Society. He grew up in a family of hikers. He's been hiking his entire life and dedicated specifically to the American Discovery Trail. And Eric, it is an honor and a pleasure for Ellen to present to you the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Discovery Trail. And Ellen, if you would do so. Eric doesn't know anything about this, by the way, folks. He's out giving the dog a treat. He just said you're supposed to give me one more. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to keep her attention. Oh, it's a, it's like a. Can you see this? This is some. It's a mile post. There's, there's his name. Yeah. Eric Seaborg, 2020, Reese Lukai Jr. Lifetime Achievement Award. So there you go. Yeah. And he really deserves it. Aww. I've seen him work on this for 30 years. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> that um, actually it is a surprise, especially when you said <laughs> Ellen was going to give me this thing here because I had no, I don't have any idea how it got in my house other than lately I've been told, don't open that, don't open that. So when things appear at our door. Thanks so, to one of your neighbors, Eric. Yeah. It's Diane. Oh, Diane? Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. This is, this is touching, it, although... It is well-deserved, Eric. And I, the only regret I have is I'm not there personally. No. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm touched. But I do have to say that I, I, want, I want to go back and emphasize what Lori was saying about 
Mike Roush and how hard he's worked on that because we literally had worked for years talking about, we people talk about the trail as going in one direction from the East Coast. And one reason for that is because we haven't had the directions going eastbound. And so all of Mike's work on that has been fantastic. And I, he just sticks with it and does it every week. Um, but thank you. What? Hold it up. Hold it up again. All right. Well, there it is. If people, when the pandemic's over and we can visit, people can come see it. Um, Lift it up a little higher. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this way so you can see the yeah and then turn it around and then turn it around okay no this way that way oh i see okay all right all right well before this meeting drags on much longer we have to do the business that that requires the meeting and i see mitch barloga has popped in and so this is his part of the meeting and that is the election of the board of directors. So Hello. take it away, Mitch. Thank you. All right, so not sure if I can share my screen. Am I able to do that? Not kidding. Let's see here. Okay, so let me uh, see if I can. That's really cool, that's really cool because. I'm gonna try to share my screen so hopefully you'll see the right somewhere. screen. Okay. Do you see the uh, the nomination report? Yes, we do. Good, it's working. Happy. By the way, hello everybody. Um, so, what we did was, well, our committee we looked at our uh, our roster from you know the two year and obviously what was being up for this year. This is who we have on, we've nominated for renewal or renewal of a two-year term to the board of directors. These are the ones that are up this year. Um, we have had a couple of people come off the board, um, but these are the ones that are looking to be nominated for this go around. We have uh, Brian and Harold, Donna, Bob Palin, Brian Stark, and then Richard Vonnegut. So both Harold and Richard will be new. They have agreed to be, they're also state coordinators as well. And they have agreed to be part of this uh, board. If I go down here, this gives you the actual board of directors as it currently exists. Um, you can see far more people have the odd year term than the even year term, far more. And we elected the, the majority of this last year. I know that uh, Ron Fowler is coming off the board, as well as Roger Dittmer. Those are the two that have uh, declined to be on the board going forward. But again, we were able to get them replaced with, um, as I told you before, with Harold and with Richard as well. I think one more also came off the board, uh, but I don't have her on there. So. Um, Moving back up, I guess we will have the election of the uh, board itself. That is the slate uh, before you here. Um, again, these are the people that are involved with the being renewed for the next two years on top of the odd uh, number of years that were renewed last year, including myself. So I take it we'll entertain a motion for the, the board, Eric. Yeah, well, if it's a committee report, it's a motion in itself and doesn't even require a second, so. Oh, so do we want to do the executive board at the same time for the entire report? No, that's done by the, that's done by the board of directors, so that's not gotcha. for this meeting. Gotcha. Thanks for setting me straight, sir. Yes, okay, the committee report has been, has been uh, explained. Are there any questions? Try to keep things succinct. I do appreciate people getting back with me with their um, desire to remain on the board and those who have uh, come off the board who still will remain as our state coordinator. So thank you for that. This is Pete Chutley. I have one comment, which is I noticed Brian Stark there. Well, I saw on my 
uh, participant list that he is listening into us, participating in this meeting from uh, the other side of the Atlantic Ocean from Switzerland. So we've got coverage in two continents here. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, the joys of technology. So I'll put it back in your lap, Eric, for- uh... Okay, well, if, there, if there's uh, no more comments, we can call it for a vote. And you can vote by, if you take your cursor down to the bottom and you'll see where it says participants. If you click on that, you will, a little box will pop, pop up and you will see on the, you will see a thing that says raise hand. So it, you can, signify an I vote at this point by clicking on your on the raise hand. I don't see the raised hand. I don't see it. Or you can just raise your hand. <laughs> or, you can raise, or you can raise your hand and or, do it that way. Carol can, yeah, I'll raise two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no. I went out again. Oh. OK, so is somebody, are you, Carol or Peter, are you, able to, are you able to record these? And uh, I can see the raised hands over in the participants box. I actually lost internet about 10 minutes ago, so I had to come in through my browser, and I do not have all the capabilities that I had prior. Um, but I can see. I, I count 13, 13 affirmative and no opposed. Well, we haven't done opposed yet because there's we have to do opposed later. Aren't you, but are you looking are you looking at the raised hands as well? Because we got John Faisal with his hand up. And oh. look like Laurel with his hand up. And Reese had his hand up. Yeah, Reese has his hands up. 11, 12, 13, 14. We now have 15 elect and we have 15 electronic hands up. Okay. I still haven't figured out how to do it. Well, just raise your hand then. Is that <laughs> okay? His hand is up, Bob's Bob. is up. All right, yeah. so we have one, two. Can you raise your hands again? One, two, three, four, five, six. I count six six visual hands. And fifteen electronic yeah. hands. I can vote. You can do you can vote. Yeah, you're a member. Right. Gary gets a vote. Gary puts his hand up too. Yeah, he's a member. <laughs> so right. that's a total of okay. twenty-two. Okay. And and if you're if you found the raise hand, if you click the lower hand, and that'll make your it's in the same spot where it was. Everybody did. Well, almost everyone. No, I'm still seeing like Mitch and um, oh, yeah, I'm still okay. seeing a few hands up. Let me lower that hand. There we go. Yeah. All right. John M. Mercurio. Yep. Um, he might want to vote no. He's like that. <laughs> well, we'll just leave him. Okay, and now if you anybody who wants to vote nay, you can click on raise hand or you can wave your hand. Um, and I'm not seeing any no votes pop up and I'm not seeing any hands raised. It, Except a few of the people who are up for election, I think, are trying to say, no, no, not me. <laughs> but, um, okay, well, I guess, it, I guess it's unanimous. I'm sorry for the confusion about it. We have never done this before, and it's um, obviously, Zoom is pretty cool, but it's, um, you know, a little hard to get a hold of. I get, so, we have the we have the chat function. I mean, I guess if you want to ask a question, you could um, unmute yourself and ask it, or you uh, can uh, hit the chat and do it. But we, you know, can just if some if people have some questions, we could um, answer those. 
Say it, talk. Oh, say it. This is Gary. Are you hearing me okay? Are we on? Yep. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, I've been sitting, uh, listening to the meeting, but also looking around the room for one thing. We have a, a very nice American Discovery Trail map on our wall. And I've heard also today about Mike Roush and him, his work to uh, do the turn by turn, both directions between Cincinnati and Denver. So I've come up with uh, just an idea to throw out at all of you while I was sitting here listening. And that would be, um, call it a suggestion if it please, but uh, I know the primary focus of the ADT is that you are the only coast to coast trail, but what about establishing and marketing a second focus for completing the Heartland Loop of the American Discovery Trail between Cincinnati and Denver? Um, and I mean that as a complete alternate objective under the ADT brand. And I think that alternative would appeal to a lot of people who don't have time to finish a whole trail, uh, but would still like to take on a hike where they will still have a sense of completion. And uh, perhaps uh, as, as opposed to doing half of a coast to coast trail, for example, I think it would also appeal to people who may feel a bit intimidated by crossing the Rocky Mountains or the Nevada desert or simply being so far away from civilization through most of the West. And um, uh, the Google Maps shows that it's about 1,200 miles between Cincinnati and Denver, whether you go the, you know, by walking, whether you go the Northern way or the Southern way. And it's something that could be done um, at 1,200 miles um, over the course of uh, you know, 15 miles per day, it would come out to like 80 days to, to, do, to do a trail. And I think over two years, someone who is a teacher, for example, or a parent with teenage kids who are off for the summer could do that kind of a trail and complete it in two years and have a full sense of completion and is still being a part of the American Discovery Trail. And I think it might serve as, as a big uh, promotion for the trail to bring in more members and more interest in the trail with all the people that don't really want to spend four years to hike out. And uh, that's about it. That's just a thought. I'd have to say it's not actually the first time it's been brought up. In fact, um, a few years ago, I was tr I was kind of pushing some of the mid middle midwestern state coordinators to focus on that as a goal because it would be particularly good for the Midwest. And I guess it's just a matter of well, how much energy do you have to put? in what direction at what time. So if you want to lead the effort. <laughs> Excellent. Well, the good thing is that it's all the same trail and it's yeah. all the same turn by turn and it's all the same people on the same trail. It's a all question the same of people who coordinate that area. So I can't see that it would be an, a whole lot of extra work to do just to well, promote it and have people go do it. Yeah, it's a question of marketing. So yeah, I think it's something we'd love to do. It's it's also kind of it's also kind of um, most of it can be done by bike, so it's we can promote it as a bike loop. Mm -hmm. One of the things we can do with the new database is produce a, a turn by turn and GPX for subsections of the trail, which we might produce you know a Heartland subsection of the trail, AD, uh, turn by turn and GPX. Mm -hmm. I think at this point we don't give any. Specific um, award for somebody who's completed a cross country thing. Um, so I don't know, because this is kind of a new, I didn't realize what he's up <laughs> we, to. We haven't talked about this. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know if you're talking about giving some sort of a certificate for having done the midsection. And then we had talked one time in the past about a certificate, something for having completed the whole trail so this could be just a different certificate i don't think carol do we give a certificate for having done i don't think i have one um for having done the american discovery no, trail yeah so that could be that could be just something as simple as a fancy printed up little certificate whether you've completed the cross-country trail or you've crossed the uh, mid-section loop you know we yeah. just 
I don't think we'd be that involved. We could just say that we will, you know, if people submit their their dates of when they started and stopped and all you know, their little summary. I know the Appalachian Trail Conservancy just asks through hikers to write up a little summary of their experiences. And so if we did that for American Discovery Trail people, whether they're doing the cross country or whether doing the midsection loop, and then we just mail them a certificate, that's a pretty low effort kind of way to and maybe acknowledge and, and excite people. And a minor effort in marketing that if you can't take the time to do an entire trail, here's an alternate for it. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. Any any other any other questions? I, I like have it. a question, but I, this is Reese Luca. I would like to maybe uh, point out the effort that Bob Phelan is making and how far we have come. Uh, the first effort to identify, identify the route why, was by Eric and Ellen and Bill Sprotty and Sam Carlson, the four people who um, made the expedition to establish the foundation of the Discovery Route. The next step in that effort was by my wife, Melinda. She spent months taking all of their scribbled notes and putting it on a word processor. This was actually before she had a computer, just a word processor. It took her months to interpret the four different handwriting styles, all the different <laughs> codes that they used for left turn, right turn, intersection, uh, the type of trail, but it took her months to do that. The next step was by Bill Stair and Trails Illustrated and putting that data on a set of GPS maps or USGS maps and coming up with his series of uh, maps. In the middle of doing that, the technology changed dramatically to what we have today, a digitized form where Harry Cyphers and Eric and Harv Hiskin and probably uh, Ralph were involved in digitizing. And I believe the American Dis uh, Discovery Trail was the very first long distance trail to uh, have its route digitized. Today, all the trails do that. Pacific Crest, Appalachian Trail, they all have a, a, a digitized route. But the technology involved in getting from those notes thousands of pages actually that Eric and Ellen and Sam and, and Bill Sprotty uh, created to what we have today just blows me away. The technology is far beyond uh, number two yellow pencil. Perhaps Eric, you and I at one time, you're the writer, we need to document uh, the phase that we've gone from your notes to what we have today. Uh, Maurice, just yesterday, I read your 2002 trail note on exactly this subject. You were way ahead of your time back then. You, you saw this all coming. Eventually, I had no clue what it was involved of, how technically <laughs> uh, challenged it is, the special expertise and knowledge that you need to have to actually be able to do it. Thanks. All right. Was there another question? I just saw all these chat messages pop up and I'm just reading them. So I got distracted. <laughs> but Could I make a comment? It's Don Burrell, Cincinnati. Uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, if you're familiar with Mary Davison, she wrote a book called Old Lady on the Trail. She has come up with the second book now. It's called Aren't You Afraid? Uh, what it looks like. Thick book. And it specifically deals with the American Discovery Trail. I think the, this, this particular, the second book, uh, deals with it where she finished up in West Virginia and her experience across Ohio. And, and I think that was in 1918. And then last year, she crossed Iowa. And, and those uh, trips are uh, very detailed Doc, detailed, documented, and uh, really emphasizes uh, 
the contacts she's had uh, with people along the trail. I think that's a very significant uh, impact of the books that she's written. There's a lot of detail to it. I just want to let the, this book just came out, I guess, in the past month or so. Um, yes, and you know, I had a little review of that book on the, I think it's on the back yes. cover. And I'm wondering um, if this is, if there's a way we could put that on our Shopify site, you know, where we could be selling that, maybe contact her. We um, are in, we're, we're having conversations with her. Okay, great. About that. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, unless there's somebody who has a pressing question, and uh, I, if people have been looking at the comments, Terry, that is, that's a neat idea about to suggesting certificates for people who um, complete states, and I think that that's another thing we've kind of we've kind of talked about. But but a lot of these things, you know, we were talking about that last year at a board meeting, and we say, okay, we'll do this program, and then we don't have the volunteers to push it across the finish line, and so they don't get done. Um, but yeah, I think that's an, I think that's another kind of thing that we'd love to do. Well, if nobody has any more questions or comments, I think we can bring the meeting to a close because we, we actually have a board of directors meeting starting pretty soon. So I want to thank everybody for coming and thank, well, you know, one thing we haven't done before we've talked about what we do, but it's um, the members that make the whole organization possible. So all of you who are here who are members, we want to thank you for your support and just hope that um, you will continue, you know, being able to support the trail and you make it all possible. And we really appreciate your um, interest and the being willing to come here on a nice Saturday in October and spend some of it, you know, with a with a meeting in front of your computer. So I want to thank everybody there. Um, and with that, and if you're I guess, interested, in, if you're interested in any of the volunteer opportunities that Eric mentioned or being on a state committee, please email me at info at discoverytrail.org, and I'll make sure you get to the right person. Are you just waving? I'm looking at my sister. You just waving hello. Just waving. Hello. See ya. Oh, See you okay. later. Nice, <laughs> nice job with the meeting, everybody. I, Great to be here. Bye bye. I, thank you. And um, yeah, so I guess I guess I'm supposed to say meetings adjourned, and then.